This is the Endo meeting on October 2nd of 2024, and we have some topics today. Eric has a so-called prosaic topic about, uh, well, I will alternate order for to Eric. And then um, ZB wanted to have a conversation and, and with uh, me and Chris Hiller, I believe, about uh, some imp implementation details of uh, dynamic require, which I like to think of as a specific case of dynamic import in the compartment mapper, which Endomote needs in order to do, uh, in order to bring in built-in modules in Endomote. Uh, and then uh, Aaron has uh, an update on durability, which I think would kick off a great conversation. We haven't talked about pet demon and durability or OCAP kernel and durability yet, and uh, it'd be really great to make some progress on that. Um, yeah, and then just updates all around, I suppose. Uh, that's our meeting today. Uh, Eric. Okay. Um, the prosaic topic is error serialization. Uh, the context is uh, we are uh, implementing async iterator streams over various transport mechanisms in the uh, web setting. And uh, some of them use a uh, structured clone. And so you can just send native error objects over those and they appear on the other side uh, in the way that you'd expect. But others uh, require safely JSONifiable data. Uh, so uh, if you send, I think, and I think actually like it uses JSON stringify. So if you pass it a native error, uh, an empty object uh, comes out on the other side. And, uh, but the async iterator stream interface specified in endo uh, lists the throw method as a uh, required method. And I think uh, that seems like a good uh, convention to me. And we would like to be able to pass native errors to that. But then the question is, if it has to be serialized under the hood, is how do we serialize those errors? So I th guess like in the daemon or like an endo generally, maybe Marshall is the thing that's handling that somehow. Um, and so I guess the question is, should we just like use Marshall directly, crib something from Marshall or like do something, do something else? That's great. That's a great lineup. I would like to pause for a word from our sponsor, Chip. Would you like to tell us how to pronounce J-S-O-N? Jason. <laughs> it's right there on the first page of the stamp. <laughs> uh, International phonetic alphabet. <laughs> I love. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I I was sick during that day of linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> On the first page of what? The uh the the ECMA four hundred four and the ISO. I can't remember the number. Uh, Jason spec. There is a footnote about the proper pronunciation of Jason, which I managed to 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 put in there uh, several years ago. Really? <laughs> uh, that's awful. Uh, in other news, uh, it's come to my attention that we've been mispronouncing JFEG for some time. Um, JFEG? Yeah, the P is for a PH, photographic. <laughs> I have a photographer friend who will absolutely adore that. Uh, no, there's nowhere you can hide. <laughs> we will find you <laughs> and annoy your annoy the daylights out of you. In any case, yeah, back to the topic. Thank you, Chip. Uh, uh, yeah, you're correct. Um, errors participate in pass style. Um, and there are some limitations on error instances when and the way that they are serialized, but that is implemented by Marshall. So if you if you use Marshall, that's going to give you an opportunity to replace all of the slots or any of the deeply nested data that might be carried by an error. But I should note that the cement is still very wet around errors. It's mm. it's it's good enough for our purposes, speaking from experience. Well, yeah. Does Marshall have a mode where you can use it to marshal things that don't require slots so that you just can use it for 
arbitrary data, but you can't use it for object references? Or do you just get that by passing null for the um, slot to valve out the slot operations? Now the analogs to slot to valve out a slot anyway. Yeah. Um, I forget what they're called, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, I don't know whether it accepts null, but it definitely would accept a function that throws an error. Um, yeah, that's for sure. Um, uh, you, yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, RFC eighty two fifty nine is um, not canon. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to take that up with the IETF. Yes. Although it does have a normative reference to ECMA 404. So yeah, there you go. It is uh, incorporated by reference. For those just tuning in, we are still talking about how to pronounce Jason. Um, <laughs> anyhow. Uh, Eric, does that answer your question? I think that the only uh, the only thing that I can say beyond that is that in OCAPN, no decision has been made at all about how OCAPN will transfer errors, and that this is all tied up in the issue of baggage propagation, or not baggage propagation, but uh, mm -hmm. trace aggregation, uh, because errors need to be able to have they need to participate in some out of band mechanism with debuggers so that. Uh, their identity, the identity of an error object needs to correspond to tracing information for the purposes of aggregation. And to add, um, when you create a Marshall instance, uh, you, you can specify hooks for what to do with errors when you ser serialize them. It doesn't mm -hmm. change the serialization, but it allows you to capture the stack or whatever you need to do and send it elsewhere. Cool. And, yeah. uh, is Marshall is Marshall fast? Do we know anything about the like performance of Marshall? I I think it's actually pretty fast because it's not. Um, there's this there's this. <laughs> we don't really quite have the proper vocabulary. I think, but when we talk about serialization, which is the rendering it down to bits. Um, that's actually done by json.stringify. Um, what Marshall does is it takes a pointer to the head of an object graph, and it gives you back a pointer to a different object graph, which is suitable for use with json.stringify and then can be undone on the other end. Um, and since it's just mostly moving stuff around and copying pointers, it's it ought to be pretty pretty speedy I mean it's obviously it's got to walk the uh, um, the object graph but most of the, most of the time you're you're not you know you're not transmitting big complicated hairy things you're, you're sending mm -hmm. some object I think that a good answer to that is is it's it's as fast as one can expect the equivalent behavior to be implemented in user code JavaScript considering yeah. that it's diving into that it's deferring the render to bytes down to a the JSON stringify built-in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but in JavaScript, it it's 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 using an intermediate representation. What you mean, mm -hmm. like, and that means that it's going to create a whole bunch of churn in your, and hopefully it doesn't overflow the 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 nursery of the garbage collector. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, yeah, it's reasonably fast. Um, there's still room for improvement. We'll be working on it. I think. Um, probably start that work within the next three months to make it even faster, but mm. it's not an issue right now that we've encountered. Cool. Um, our, our round trip times on chain are like five seconds. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. Don't yeah. Trust think when... our, yeah. Don't trust our performance <laughs> uh, tolerance. I think one of the big caveats is that the only things that you can marshal are hardened objects. Uh, right. That's, and and that's, they need so to be pastel. That's that's part of the um the room for improvement is that marshalling encompasses past style checks. Hmm. 
the uh and fi final question uh is there a way to pass the intermediate representation or to just like skip the stringification and just grab oh, the absolutely if you use if you use marshall directly you get the ir um and you can do whatever what you want with that cool uh, including including sending it via structured clone uh, because uh, if it can be safely stringified, we can also safely just pass the uh, IR uh, over the wire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your your web socket, your message. <laughs> our our wires uh, in our context <laughs> right. anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, okay. the, the, yeah, that's that's important. That's important. That's important for um, other other implementations as well. It's important to OCAPN, or rather, it has uh, it has structural implications for OCAPN. Um, which I was speaking about earlier this morning with folks at Agoric was that OCAPN as OCAP OCAPN as specified today relies on this the um serial framing of syrup messages. They're just you get a syrup message and when you get the end to the end of a syrup message, you're expecting the next syrup message, etc. So there isn't an outer frame, um, which means that you have to have a streaming implementation on some systems. And if you're trying to haul that over, if you're trying to haul syrup over WebSocket, you're going to do something else with a different syrup implementation. And that's a bit annoying. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that does it for the uh, prosaic component of our agenda today. Uh, thanks. Cool. Um, ZB or Aaron, do you want to flip a coin or just charge ahead, ZB, if you wish? Yeah, go ZB. All right, let's try to make this quick. Uh, so, oh, one moment. Um, also, uh, apropos of the last topic, the etymology of Marshall is um, person who lines up horses. So, like, there's etymologically, not much difference between serialization and marshalling. We're we're begging a distinction that doesn't exist in the meanings of the words. Interesting. Um, Markham talked about would 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 describe this talking about marshalling in the context of um, railroad trains, and was um, you know where you assemble a train in a yard, and uh, he was very upset when I informed him that 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 usage is um, a, a, a Britishism, and that in the United States the proper term is switching. Nice. All right, ZB, go. Okay, uh, so. I don't know how to be more specific. Um, selecting compartments in the import now process. What's the algorithm about? <laughs> uh, so don't make me answer. Don't make Chris answer. <laughs> no. What is it? Are you which algorithm are you referring to, ZB? There are a couple. Yeah, so you left a comment. Please take a look at Chris's new algorithm with the pre-computed compartment set. Uh, and that's a fix for something being suboptimal when called multiple times at runtime, which is nice to improve. So uh Actually, I can, there... I can explain, I can explain. So, all right, so you know, when we wrote that thing, uh, originally I had these, these loops. Um, first there was an outer loop and I'll talk about that in a second, but the inner loops, they look for stuff in the, the scope property of all the compartment descriptors yeah. to make the uh, establish that there's a relationship between the two. And that is just yeah. like, we were iterating over all the scopes, over all the, um, and then like, like digging into them and uh, doing a map and all this stuff. We were just like doing way too much work um, because it would have to happen multiple times for 
you know, potentially every, if, if there was a whole lot of things that uh, happen to be um, dynamically, dynamically required be an absolute path in your, in your app or whatever, that's going to happen a lot. And mm -hmm. so um, Chris suggested that instead of that, what we can do is actually just stuff the data that we need onto the compartment descriptor when we're building the compartment descriptors. So we're doing that in the node module module um, mm -hmm. and building up the compartment descriptors. And then there we just, um, we, we add a property called compartments, which is a set of uh, all the related compartments. Uh, it, essentially. Um, okay. And so we can just, that's, that's a constant lookup. And so we can just look, look that up instead of doing all these loops. Then the second part is um, uh, originally what we were doing was- Can I interject um, here go ahead. before go ahead. we go to the next loop? Uh, yes. I remember looking at those loops and suggesting we could save some iteration by narrowing it down to only things allowed by policy anyway. So I, I guess that uh, transfers to the current implementation in node modules or in the next pass of processing the compartment map uh, where we take policy into account anyway, we could narrow down the pre-generated list of compartments now, which I, I accept, uh, again, uh, might be a premature optimization, but now that this is merged, we could consider it. That sounds good to me, having yeah. filtering the compartment set to those that are intended to be reachable by policy as, um, as a, uh, an effect of applying policy seems to make, makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and 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 then we could forego with the uh, the enforcement check in there, um, because we would have done that already. Um, well, but let's let's just make an issue for that and and look at it. But the other part was what we were doing when we we have this absolute path. We don't know what compartment this absolute path belongs to, right? And so we are looking through all the compartment descriptors every time to try to match. And you may have a lot of compartment descriptors. And so what Chris suggested was, well, whatever we are going to um, require is going to be somewhere in the, um, in the, the, okay, first off, we're guaranteed an absolute path. And that is a file URL. And so we can use that file, file URL to crawl up the file system um, to find the um, the uh, the compartment. Uh, thing we're yeah the compartment we're looking for, um, and we can because the compartment names are those file URLs, and so instead of n being all the compartments, n is now the depth of the uh, file system um, to the root, which is oh, like okay know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that was staring us in the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's also it also improves correctness because you can have because with the previous algorithm there was some order dependence um, in the 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 enumeration order of the compartment list such that it was possible to discover the compartment that contained the node modules directory of the compartment that you were searching for, that would match a prefix check. Um, oh yeah, that was actually incorrect for some cases of nested dependencies, especially bundled dependencies. Yeah. So this, uh, <laughs> so the, so we fix, fix the performance and correctness of the algorithm by going back to, um, searching um searching for the the longest matching compartment prefix okay nice yeah um topic done <laughs> yeah and then, then then also a comment that you made on the on the pr was uh that uh i had made a point that 
there is a weak correspondence between the name of a dependency in the dependencies object and the name, the self-ascribed name of the package in the package JSON. Um, that there are cases where those can be different. And you made the comment that, hey, maybe we should have test fixtures that, that exercise that distinction, um, to which I say, yes. And we should also, yeah, we also should have some test fixtures for nested node modules as well, if we don't already. Right? Ideally, something that would have tripped up the, the bug that was present we definitely have some fixtures for that somewhere, but uh, I I can't off the top of my head tell whether it's an endo or lava moat. Yeah, and and when when where those test fixtures fixtures exist, it would require a certain level of cleverness to guarantee that the fixtures would exact would exact exercise a defect if if there were one. Like we would have to have a test fixture where the enumeration order was backward or forward, like a pair of them, so that you were guaranteed to trip a bug regardless of the ordering. Anyhow, tests. Uh, we, we could order uh, a compartment map uh, randomly uh, in tests to trigger weird behaviors. Well, our compartment map is forced to be in lexical order for determinism reasons. So uh, randomness is, well, for one, I don't want random test failures. I want deterministic test failures. Um, but also we can rely on, we can rely on the compartment mapper to force a deterministic order to the enumeration of compartments. Um, yeah, this uh, is a subgenre of fuzzing, uh, the, the thing mm -hmm. I meant. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, and we have some manual fuzzing in somewhere. Oh yeah, and syrup, and uh, there's some manual fuzzing that we can copy paste code from in the syrup implementation if we need it. Um, yeah, all right. Also, I think in either Pastile or Marshall. Oh, is that uh, that's property-based testing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Can somebody uh, point me to where that, that is? I don't know where yes, it is. I will find it. OK. Um... Yeah, drop that in hardened MetaMask. I'll, I'll look at it as well. OK. All right. Okay. Topic done. Thank you. Aaron. Cool. I'm going to give an update on gems. Uh, can you see my screen okay? It's a little small, but it is legible. It is small? Okay. I thought it was already gigantic. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, we'll be fine. It'll do? Okay. Um. Okay, cool. So I'm going to give an update on GEMS. GEMS is this uh, experiment of what if we, uh, what DevX do we get when we build an OCAP kernel on top of uh, the durable, durable zones in Agoric SDK? Um, I talked about the, uh, I, I think I presented the external reference controller last week um, and the first draft of it. And what the external reference controller does is it provides durability to remote presences, like the kind you get over CAPTP. Um, though it was very hacky. It, and because I mentioned them last time, I'll just mention them again. Uh, but these have since been fixed. So in the previous version, there was uh, you had to communicate with the external reference controller on the other side. So that had to be part of the bootstrap. Don't need to do that anymore. There was a, a period where the persistence wasn't actually working correctly immediately after you tried to persist it. That's not true anymore. Um, and then when you put something in storage and pulled it back out, you got a promise instead of getting the presence itself. And that's not true anymore. Um, and the advantage of the previous version that had all those issues is that it didn't require any changes to CAPTP. But with the help of Michael Fig, I made some yet unmerged changes to CAPTP um, that uh, fix all those problems. Um, so additionally, I extended the, ex uh, the external reference controller to handle uh, lazy CAPTP connections and reconnections. 
Um, so you can, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, um, and this can unlock uh, lazy and sleepy bats. Um, so I'll explain what that means. So uh, I would like to, you know, the, the effort here can be summarized by this little test on the left. Um, we do all this magical wiring to uh, set up the way we connect Alice and Bob. Uh, we get Alice's CAPTP object. We request the remote bootstrap for Bob. We've already set up uh, Bob to have this specific facet here, which is a uh, durable uh, class uh, with this implementation here. Um, and so then, as you'd expect, we can ping across uh, this network boundary to, to Bob, and then we can force a disconnection of CAPTP, and then reusing Bob, it will restart that connection, that CAPTP connection. Um, so not only are these presences um, durable, which is not demonstrated here, uh, these presences uh, have can have a life cycle longer than the CAPTP connection. Normally, when you disconnect CAPTP, uh, any further usage of that presence will fail. Um, and but here it is uh, has the wiring inside of it in order to re-request a, uh, a connection. And in fact, it will not. You know, if you put this in storage and then you pull it out, it will not. Um, request a connection to the other side uh, until it's used. So it's it's very lazy in requiring its connectivity and uh, it is not fragile to its connectivity. So if you if there's an intermittent network error between two remote hosts, um, this it does not make this facet fr fragile. Um, okay, so we can look at the, so yeah, this is based on the new version of external reference controller. Um, mm -hmm. May I ask some orienting questions? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, if we can go look back at the test. Uh, if we were to reframe this so that Bob had some durable state, like if Bob were a counter example. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we need a init function. Uh, we would say this dot state, this state is equal uh, to dot count equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And then we can do this dot state dot count plus equals one. Um, yes. So and then presumably return this state count minus one. <laughs> um, this will uh, yeah. So this test does not show persistence. It doesn't show VAT restarts. Um, but this state would be persistent both across VAT restarts and, of course, uh, uh, across uh, CAPTP restarts. Um, the only thing I'm demonstrating here is CAPTP restarts. I'm 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 somewhat confused. Where does where where does Bob actually live? So in this demo, <clears throat> I, ideally this demo would be or this test would be demonstrated via two separate processes, but here it is inside of one process and they are, uh, uh, this, uh, this make connect, reconnecting cap DP is just a test utility. Um, but I am creating two separate zones, uh, and then exposing them to each other. Right. So the piece, the piece of the puzzle that I'm not following is uh, when Bob is persisted, Bob is persisted um, under an identifier. And when Bob is passed over the wire via CAPTP, um, an identifier is created. That's what goes in the, in the slots. Um, and there is, for, for a CAPTP connection, there is what essentially amounts to a, an allocation counter for generating new IDs as they are needed um, as as objects are exported over the wire, object references are exported over the wire. And then when the CAPTP connection goes away, you create a new CAPTP connection that ends up resetting that counter. So how does the identity of Bob persist across the uh, 
the breaking and reestablishment of the connection. May I yeah, take a excellent, guess before Aaron answers? My, my guess is that this CAPTP connection is a special kind of CAPTP connection, which creates a durability membrane where all references are durable. Um, and so and I only did... durable objects can pass through the membrane. Is that right? Um, yes, let me show you what I have there. Um, so you create this thing called the external reference controller, and here is how it uh, wants you to configure CAPTP in order to work. Um, I've created a few new hooks in, um, in CAPTP. Um, it, there is this on before import hook. This is similar to the uh, import hook, which currently exists, except that it allows you to specify the presence you want to use when a new slot is encountered, when a new slot is imported. Um, there is the on before export hook, which is when this is when you're sending a value across CAPTP. Uh, for the first time, there's this new value. This allows you to specify the slot for it. And an implication here is that the slot you provide can't interfere with the incrementing slot that uh, CAPTP internally uses. Um, but if you're here, we're, we're overriding every slot, I think, so that internally doesn't use slots. Um, I, I need to verify that statement. However, um, I know that the slots that I'm using are not conflicting with CAPTPs internally. Um, the There's also a new hook for the missing export hook. Um, this is when you've uh, restarted a cap. So the cap CAPTP has internally its own import export tables. Um, and then we, outside of that, inside the external reference controller, have our own import export tables um, because we are going to, this one is going to be dur durable. Not only is it going to survive multiple CAPTP sessions, it may sur uh, survive multiple VAT restarts. Um, so we have our own durable import export tables. Um, and so CAPTP might be like, hey, on the other side, it told me, uh, it was referencing this exported slot, but I don't have a slot there in my export table. So here we can fill in the, the external uh, export table. So this missing export hook allows the external reference controller to say like, oh yes, here is the value that you have exported here. Slot. Additionally, there's the G GC hook, which is when the other side of the CAPTP connection says you no longer need this export, uh, you can clear it from the table. And so we use that to also not just remove it from the CAPTP sessions export table, but also from the external reference controllers export table. Um, and so this is how we achieve uh, a sort of a durable CAPTP session on top of the normal CAPTP session. I'm just I'm just wondering if you could if you could wrap it as something that, and this may be in fact what you're actually doing, and I'm just not following completely. Um, have have what in essence amounts to a a um, durable CAPTP connection, uh, and it just looks like a CAPTP connection for everything it's expecting to use. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's what's uh, achieved here with minimal, you know, by layering on top of the CAPTP implementation with just adding a few hooks. We could push this all the way into the CAPTP implementation, um, but this Over. is the way. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't even know if it has to go into the CAPTP implementation per se, although there might be value in that once it's all all the you know once it's all shaken down. Um, um, I'm just thinking that it could be, um, uh, you know, a, a substitutable replacement in all of the places that you're using a CAPTP connection, and that would um, that would have that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty much what I have here. Um, yeah. In addition to these new hooks that I've introduced, there's a couple more um, things that need to happen that don't happen in hooks. One, there is a so, word wrap is making this hard to read. There is a a couple new methods. Um, uh, there's import slot. I ended up uh, using this and then removing it, so this may not need to be part of the the change to CAPTP. Um, but it allows you to say. Hey, uh, give me, I know you, you haven't set this up yet, but I want a new presence for this slot. I want you to register this as an import. Um, so this is just getting CAPTP to prepare a presence for you. For you. 
Um, I ended up not needing this in this later version of external reference controller, so this may not be necessary. Um, there's also this export value, which is saying, hey, I have this value in this slot and I want you to put it in your export table. Um, is This is kind of like the, the missing export hook. Um, the, and then there is a method internal at FTP, which I've now exposed, and this is the make remote kit. And this is, uh, creates a presence, um, a handled promise for communicating with, um, the remote slot given a slot, but it doesn't register it as the presence for the table. And so I use this in the delegate presence, which I'll, I'll show in a moment. Um, the so the external reference controller implementation um, uses uh, uh, this thing called, I'm calling a presence controller, and it's just its job is you say, hey, I want a presence for this slot. Um, and the reason why I kick this out of the external reference controller implementation is so that I can have um, if I just want durable CAPTP presences. The implementation looks one way. And then if I want to have these presences that you know lazily kick off a cap TP connection, the implementation looks different again. Um, so that's uh, different types of presence controller um, provide that. Um, here's the simple one. It just you know uh, requests cap TP to get the it ma makes a presence for the the slot from the cap TP. Um, the reconnecting one creates a... sharing your screen. I did. Yep. I still see your screen. I don't. That's weird. Did I pause it or something? Can you oh, see the no. make presence for? Okay, no, it's all I, good. I, okay, no, going. this is just a. Uh, this is this is feature creep in Zoom. Never mind. Carry on. No problem. Okay, so. This is the other kind of, this is the more complicated presence controller that uh, enables the like reconnection of CAPTP or the lazy connection of CAPTP. And so you just give it a, a means of establishing that connection. And for the presence, it uses uh, this eventual factory delegate, um, which looks like this. It is a handled promise that uh, just reapplies all those things and, so whenever you call a method or something on it, it will re-request its target every time an action happens on it and then forward that. And so here, uh, here is our like re-request of the target. And it's basically saying, do I have a do I have an active presence for this CAPDP connection? And if I don't, make one. Um, and so it uses it uh it will forward to the current um FTP connection, and then I'll wait for there to be a connection if there's one. Okay, so that's what enables the um, the the reconnecting and the lazy connecting. Um, and so the idea there, the reason why I pursued that is so um, you could durably have a reference to an object in a VAT that isn't even on. And so we could like not start the VAT, or we can put the VAT to sleep, and you can still hold that reference, pass it around, do whatever you want to do it, and not until you actually you know call a method on it does it go and wake up that thing. Um, so that's what that uh, machinery looked like. Um, additionally, working with the durable zone stuff, um, uh, I use exos in in a lot of places. And then I also am experimenting with using non-exos because exos are, are rather opinionated. Um, and so I made this make custom durable kind uh, methods of different kinds. Uh, and you basically specify a make function, a reanimate function, and a cleanup function. And it handles um, setting an ID and informing the um, VOM kit that this thing needs to be um, uh, persisted in, is persisted in this way and associated with the slot and that sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, so I have a few different versions of these. There's one that gives you a, uh, a proxy object, which is backed by a map store and you can remove and delete um, things from it. So it makes upgrades uh, straightforward, I guess. Um, 
one, so I don't have anything really to show off here. I'm just saying I'm experimenting with, with different ways of, of making durable objects and trying to figure out what actually is nice to work with. The, the um, one question I have, uh, sorry, with VomKit uh, is that we, we're providing, um, so the, the make is when you're making a new one for the first time, reanimating is when something's brought out of memory and you want to bring it back into memory. And then cleanup is when it's been deleted, when it no longer exists. But it seems like there's a missing lifecycle method for when something is being brought out of memory. And so I wanted to ask Chip about that, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, so when you have a, um, an, a VOMKit aware object, um, it can be in memory. It can be on disk, which I guess means virtual, um, or it can be, it could not exist. Um, and so when we move from uh, uh, not existing to in memory, that's a make. Uh, we move from disk to in memory, that's a reanimate. We move from existing to not existing, that is a cleanup. But if we move from existing to virtual to uh, ah, so 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 we we made a distinction between um, virtual and durable. The the only difference there being that they they, they both exist on disk, but uh, um, virtual is just ephemeral in the sense that if the process goes away, it is also gone. Okay, um, I think but, virtual is not the word I want to use. But brought out of memory, durable. But yes, but out of memory. Well, the logic is the same. Um, the, the distinction there is that this is not a uh, this is not something which is visible um, um, to the to the the referencer of the object the uh, the virtual object mechanism um, it's like demand page virtual memory um, uh, in that it would it would swap to disk when it needed to and it would throw stuff out of memory uh, on its own you know, reckoning of whether it needed the space or not, and then would swap things in on demand. And so um, um, they're, they're the, the, the original version of this maintained a, an LRU cache, um, and it just would um, uh, populate things in, in, in memory uh, based on whether they were you know, in it would just it would put them in the in the cache, and then when you went when you went to reference them, they'd either be in the cache, in which case you get them quickly, or they wouldn't be, in which case you have to load them from disk, and then they'd get put at the head of the the, the LRU. Um, so, I, I so, think if it, so if you're looking yeah, think, for verb, I, it's it's well, there's a key distinction here which might be being lost. I'm not sure. Which we we made a distinction between. Uh, if you if you look at the uh, virtual object manager implementation, there's a distinction between what's called the representative, and then it has a thing called the inner self. Um, and the inner self is the thing that holds all of the state, um, and it's the thing that can swap in and out of memory um, uh, on demand. And then there is um, uh, the representative, which is an in-memory thing that exists as long as there's some other in-memory thing that references it. And it is it, it comes into existence or goes away based on the behavior of the Java, JavaScript engine's uh, garbage collector. Um, and, um, and so if what you have is a is a um, a, a reference, which is just say a slot, i.e. You know the reference. You have a reference to a durable object which exists in your world, but nobody in your memory is currently pointing to it. Then there is no representative. And then say somebody sends you a message containing a, a, a reference to that. Now there needs to be an in-memory representative, and so one is created. But it can just be created anew because since by definition there wasn't anybody else in your memory space that had a pointer to it, uh, you can do that. Um, and so there's always, as long as anybody in memory is referring to the object, there's this little stub object that, 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 that is the representative that will always be there. Whereas okay, the, the, that, whereas that the inner sense. self is the thing that, 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 that 
would uh, fall in and out on on an LRU basis, which could be potentially uh, arbitrarily sized, that actually holds the the state of the object, you know, all of its properties and so forth. Um, okay, yes, that makes sense to me, especially in the case of exos. I have been kind of hacking on top of VomKit without really understanding how it works underneath. And um, I don't think I've set, I don't think I have like a representative versus inner self. Um, yeah, no, that's a completely, that's an internal implementation detail within the virtual object manager. You should never see that. Uh, yes, just, however, of, because I'm, of, sorry, because I'm defining durable kinds, I'm a custom durable kinds and not using exos. I think I am interacting with this layer a little bit. But I've failed to create this distinction, I believe. And the currently I'm using the both VRM register kind um, and uh, uh, fake stuff register entry uh, in order to make my custom classes. Yeah, I, I think that's, yes, you are interacting with those things. Um, uh, most of my deep understanding of this, which is which is quite old and therefore possibly quite stale, uh, predates the existence of exos um, because we didn't have those when we we did this. That that got layered on later, um, and so my mental model is is still pretty mired in the pre exo world. So I'm not sure what um, additional complications, if any, exos have introduced on this, or they just layer on top of the the, 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 the VOM API uh, as is. I, I think they do, but... but... Okay, um, I will... I wouldn't be surprised if in my implementations here, I'm not making a distinction between representative and inner self, and so I'm keeping these well, things uh, in memory. I yeah, mean, just uh, using these things uh, wrong. Yeah, as I say, from, from, from the perspective of the, your world, that is not a st distinction which should be in any way visible to you. Um, and um, because it should be purely an internal implementation detail within the object manager, virtual object manager. Um, um, uh, I don't, as I say, I don't know if Exos have modified that, that story, but I don't think they have. Um, I... Uh... The, the the thing is, is VOM is also in bed with the garbage collector in ways that you you that should be transparent to you. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. I was just wondering if there's that missing lifecycle hook since I'm you know per, uh, for you know um, for these custom implementations. Though I I, I don't actually have a need for it getting moved out of memory. Um, but I guess I could foresee one. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, 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 I suspect, um, as I say, I, I suspect that 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 is that is that is transparent from from your perspective, and and therefore you you wouldn't need it because it wouldn't be a thing that 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 reflects any distinction that you can you can perceive. Um, it would be something like a post eviction notification, right? Be like the uh, virtual it, object it, manager yeah. that just informs you that this is the ID of the thing that's no longer. Yeah, I mean the thing that's a little weird here is you're now in a world where you're managing the IDs yourself, and um, mm. yeah, don't... that makes it difficult to to yeah, that makes yeah, it which 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 is which is the a piece of the puzzle that I'm I'm not quite wrapping my head around. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about this is um, the the stuff that 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 you were showing us earlier reminds me of a, a thing I did um, some years ago when I was working in with mobile games, where we had the problem of uh, interacting with an object over the network, and you walk out of the range of say your local. Uh, uh, wireless access point and suddenly your device has a different IP address than it had before. And and so uh, you would like to have the illusion of a continuous connection. And so I built a layer on top of TCP, which I called resumable TCP, which which allowed allowed you to have 
what looked like a, a, a durable connection, even though the underlying connections that made it up were ephemeral. The interesting thing that what you've done introduces is the ability to make that reconnection uh, lazy based on um, whether you actually need to interact with the thing or not. And um, um, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just wondering if 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 that needs to be in bed with the code, which is alloc actually allocating the um, the slot identifiers, because um, um, if you need to manage those yourself, uh, I think you've got some abstraction ex abstraction boundary crossing problems that may be tripping you up, and this that may be the basis of your your sense of uh, a need for this additional uh, hook. Oh, uh, the, what I presented with the external reference controller and what I'm showing now with the custom kinds, custom durable kinds, they are separate. Okay. Uh, they're not, well, the external reference controller does use the, these custom kinds abstractions, uh, but the, the, ex the custom kinds don't know anything about the external reference controller. Okay. The, 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 then, well, in this case, then you're not right here. You're not actually, um, um, you're not actually dealing in the world of, of the, the slot identifier. So um, I think this implementation was mostly copied based on the XO uh, implementation. Right. Um, and the, you know, the instances are stored, you know, we, we uh, set up a uh, bit from a zone. We set up a couple of, we set up a store, um, where we keep track of, we store the kind ID, so we only ever generate a kind ID, and the kind ID comes from the VRM. And then um, we also keep track of the next instance ID, which starts at zero, no, starts at one. Um, and so those are in durable stores. And so those always mm -hmm. make based on the durable stores. Hmm. Um, oh, in any case, like, um next steps like how would we integrate something like this and what would its operational character be and all of those things are interesting um i i am imagining that if we were to integrate this with the pet demon as writ uh it would be something like well first we get to the point where we have locators and then this is a kind of locator for a durable um, get, we need, we need locators for durable objects. Um, and that's essentially what you're, what you're doing, right? Is you're assigning, you're assigning a correspondence between some durable, uh, some part of a durable locator, um, so that you can restore it in a subsequent, so you can restore, um, a reference across a restart. Yeah, so I can take any value and mark it as durable, but in doing so, I need to specify how it's reanimated, and I need to define those instructions uh, at startup, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, with the changes made to cap, the proposed changes for CAPTP, I can um, like load things into the CAPTP as export tables. Um, so I can I can set up my own. Uh, presences that last multiple CAPTP sessions. I can mark them as durable and, you know, tell the system how to recreate them. Um, and then I just need to like get them into CAPTP's table and then I get. Yeah. yeah. So an, an, an important consideration is that your CAPTP needs to be able to do both durable and ephemeral references through the, the reconnected membrane. Uh, uh Yes, yeah. actually, this is my final question. I know we're like over, uh, but my, my final question is like, so right now I'm requiring everything that passes over CAPDP to either be copy data or durable. And I don't allow non-durable stuff to go across. And the I like this restriction because it means that anything you get over, you can put in storage. And that is really straightforward. Um, however, uh, if you have little ephemeral useful things like iterators and things like that, 
um, you know, those are nice to hand over and it's kind of annoying to create a bunch of machine machinery around them and to not use the native uh, JavaScript syntax or, or like need to like layer on, by the way, this is how I created this iterator and this is how you can recreate it if it ever needs to be used again, even though I'm only going to use it for 30 seconds. Um, that that kind of stuff would be annoying, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I I mean, it feels like what you're having to do is is to recapitulate a bunch of the machinery which already exists at the next layer down, so that you can have control over bits of it. Um, um, and and uh, one way is to have have hooks that let you have control over bits of it, and the other would be to um, uh, to simply make the 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 next layer down. Uh, uh, able to deal with these these abstractions directly, um, and then be able to repurpose all of that existing mechanism um, in place, um, uh, which which might be um, uh, might be considerably simpler from a, a user's perspective. Uh, the the what what it, in doing so, I would want to preserve the ability to by default have ephemeral CAPTP sessions without entraining a requirement that all CAPTC, CAPTP sessions be associated. Well, it, that's ex exactly right. Just as the current virtual object system can have um, you know, virtual and durable objects, and uh, durable objects are not allowed to refer to virtual objects, but virtual objects can refer to durable objects. The, the, the complication here is you kind of like to multiplex this could be durable, could be virtual relationship over a distinction over a single underlying uh, communications link rather than having to have two different channels, one which works one way and one which works the other. And that's, that is a, a piece that I can't quite wrap my head around yet. Yeah. Well, in any case, one of the virtues of your implementation, Aaron, as it's written is that it completely bypasses the question of how do you um, how do you partition the namespace for slots such that these names correspond to ephemera and these names correspond to virtual or durable. It's, it's all durable. <laughs> um, we, I mean, CAPTP already partitions cap uh, cap uh, partitions capabilities between remotables and cap data, um, but uh, I could see wanting. I, 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 it, it is, it is a concern of CAPTP to ensure that there are not collisions between these namespaces. So I, I can imagine subsuming that concern into CAPTP proper, um, and there might be a way to do that without conflating um, a dependency on virtual or dur durable implementations. Yeah, I mean the the the, the existing um, uh, virtual object manager, I think, I think already makes a distinction in in the form of the the object reference uh, that gets um, that gets serialized and so um, it it really feels like you ought to just be able to repurpose that same mechanism but um, thinking about how exactly how you do that uh, over a, a network connection it, it's one of those sort of slippery things that 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 feels like it makes sense you know, in a hand wavy kind of level, but then it kind of slips away when you try to actually pin it down. And I think uh, I think one of the one of the things here is this code. Um, I think is doing a lot of the exploratory work that we need in order to understand how, actually how to pin that down. Um, in any case, I think that between Very this cool. and yeah, I think we're. We're getting a better picture of what our options are going forward, and I have yet to see a, a thing that I find encouraging about these directions of exploration is that it does not seem like we have to start over from scratch. I think that we can shimmy these things into what we've got and then slough off the things that we don't want in the end um, when when the time comes. If yeah, if, I'm, I'm wondering if if this this might be piling on complications, but um... Um, I'm wondering if if Aaron also should have a conversation with um, Matthew, who has given a, a bunch of thought to how we would do 
uh, durable promises. Um, and I think those introduce some of these same complication issues. Yeah, and I'm paging that in right now. I've been asked to throw in on the async flow effort because that is important to us at Agoric. Um, so that's that's going to be occupying a lot of my attention for the next couple of weeks at least. The which is which is relevant, right? Because the async flow, uh, the async flow is uh, a way to program. Uh, durable control, uh, durable, um, durable workflows programmed as async functions and async functions that are using async await and ideally also using eventual send or something like it. Um, and we're, we're trying to puzzle a way to do that uh, while being backed by durable state, right? So the way that async flow works is very, has a quality in common with what you've done, Aaron. That is that it, it has a durable only membrane, right? But it's durable only membrane is saying on the far side, there are durable vows that are represented on the ephemeral side of the membrane as ordinary promises for the purposes of async await. Um, and then the, the the challenge that we're running up again is getting continuity getting continuity of the uh, um continuity through eventual send um on the on the on the on the ephemeral side of that membrane which is tricky because every every eventual send on the near side is producing an, a, a promise that corresponds to a new vow on the durable side um but uh we're having some trouble hooking up that relationship um yeah yeah i think th this uh leads to my primary concern i mean so far with the trivial examples i've built on top of this i've found working with durable zones to be a really really nice experience um and uh you know you kind of just get to write javascript and it feels great um but i'm wondering the more I build non-trivial examples, how much I need to do things that don't look like normal JavaScript in order to like get vows, in order to get async flow. If it starts, uh, you know, if it stops looking like normal JavaScript, then it's it's not going to have this great DevX that I want it to have. So um, uh, I, I need to like build less trivial uh, examples on top and, and see. Uh, yeah. What yeah, the, the point of async flows is that, yeah, we we have a durable membrane because we need these async, async flows to persist across restarts and upgrades. Um, and, and when I want to look at, I want to like take a look at these things sometime soon, um, is this Agoric SDK Val, Agoric SDK async flow, or where should I find this? Your guesses are all correct. Awesome. Okay, that's all for me for this week. All right. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.